uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Khanna. Uh, I work at uh, as an SHO at Kingston Hospital. And today we would be doing uh, rheumatology. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, just an overview. Rheumatology is basically when our body starts to like harm our own self. So that is when we get the rheumatological diseases. So it's like our body is becomes our enemy, in other words. Yeah. But to start with, uh, in that uh, we would also be covering a few of the ortho topics. So um, and in between every um, every now and then we would be having some cases as well to discuss. And it would be really great if you can give your input as well when we are doing the cases. So let's start. Yeah. Okay, so the first case study is this. So there is a five year old child which presents with pain of spontaneous onset in his knee for two days. He has developed mild fever on the second day. He can walk but has a limp and on examination he has painful restriction of movements in the hip. What do you think is the most common diagnosis for this patient? OK, so whenever we are doing the case studies, well, what is recommended is that we instead of like finding the answer, we should rule out the other causes. So as it gives an acute history, uh, obviously it can't be osteosarcoma, which is like a cancerous thing and also can't be TB as well because TB also used to have a chronic course. And we obviously having a mild fever, which should be either an inflammation, any kind of inflammation. So our most common two diseases would be the septic arthritis or the osteomyelitis. The thing is they say that he can walk but has a limp. So whenever there's osteomyelitis, there's usually on the shaft of the bone and the septic arthritis are usually on the like on the joints. So and it all it states that there is like in his knee. So the answer of this uh, case study would be septic arthritis. Yeah. So what is septic arthritis? It is like an inflammatory joint disease caused by bacterial, viral and fungal infection. And how do we get it? It can be like uh, due to a uh, trauma to the joint or it can be due to some infection anywhere else in our body, which spreads through blood and affects the joint. So we have like different causes of osteoarthritis. It can be a direct trauma, trauma or we are doing some surgery in the joint area or it can also be through osteomyelitis when there's infection in the shaft of the bone and it gets to the joint. Yeah. And the used organism involved is Staph aureus, but uh, usually septic arthritis is very common in children. And when it is in children, it is because of the hemophilus influenza, which usually affects the lungs of the kids. So from the lungs, from the respiratory area, it goes back to your joints in your blood your blood slim, and then it affects the joint. Clinical features are obviously you would be having like pain. Yeah, and usual uh, if it's a it's hip in children and knee in adults and then you would be having like some because again inflammation is happening and then you would not be able to move the joint because you would be having pain while moving the joint and on examination we will also see the same thing that is the decreased or absent range of motions and there would be signs of inflammation the joint would be warm it could be red and it would pain when you touch it so the investigation is joint aspiration and immediate microbiology investigation. Like we have to aspirate from the joint and then we can send it for the cultures and obviously your cultures would be positive. Other investigations are we can also check the inflammation of the blood and you will have like the increased inflammatory markers. You can also have raised WCCs that are your white cell counts. Uh, if it's septic arthritis, because obviously the uh, bacteria would lead to like inflammation would increase the leukocytes. And then we can also do gram stain, but usually the treat the investigation is finished from the like blood culture and the joint aspirations. This is a table which can help you differentiate between different arthritis. So we'll just focus on the septic one because there is inflammation in the joint. Obviously, your joint aspirate would be like thick. The viscosity would be low. Yeah, and the white cell count would be raised. And you would have like increased in PMNLs that are your neutrophils. Usually when there is an acute problem, your PMNL and other neutrophils are raised. And when it's a chronic, your lymphocytes are raised. So just remember this. So in septic, you would have raised WCCs with increased in polymorphonuclear cells. So the X-ray would, this is a later stage of the X-ray. Usual the X-ray would be having some like widening of the joint pains and swelling. But later you will start to see that the 
space is like it's not uniform. You can see here that the joint space has significantly reduced and it's not uniform. It's like very like abrupted kind of a joint space. And this is this extra is basically of a knee uh, of an ankle. Sorry, it's from my of an ankle. We can also do ultrasound or radio stop, eye stop scan, CT scans or MRI, but usually they are not recommended because we're able to make the diagnosis from the blood investigation and the x-rays and you would often be presented like with us children of like a particular set of people who are having. So usually these are very highly used, but still if someone you can do that as well. Application it can if it's obviously if it's not treated at that time you can have complication, you can have you can have disruption and the most common ones well I have wrote in the last but it's the most common one you can develop osteomyelitis abscess or sinus because now think it that way that you are there is some infection in your body which has not been treated obviously it would lead to more and more infection leading to abscess yeah so treatment as it is bacterial so we will giving you flococcin and um, we start from a very high dose of antibiotics in septic arthritis because uh, bacterial infection in our body is still uh, not that major than it's in a bone like it, it's fed, it has reached your joint so it is like a big deal so we start with like iv antibiotics and these are given two grams qds that is like two grams every six hours iv route and after that we switch to oral route and that so the treatment overall would last somewhere around six weeks. If the patient has penicillin allergy, which is fairly I can see very much common here, we can give clindamycin. If patient has MRS, MRSA, we can give vancomycin or ticoplanin. But uh, whenever you're giving some drug like ticoplanin or like vanco, we have to do referral first and after that only we can do that. OK, so I think by this we finish the septic arthritis. Our next topic, as you can see, is giant cell arthritis. OK, so um, giant cell arthritis is a rheumatological emergency. I, uh, if you ask me, one of the major RA emergencies out of all the RA diseases, I think it's the GCA. Because you can, um, if it's not treated on time, you can be like permanently blind, like there's no like temporary blind. You will be like permanently blind. OK, so giant cell arthritis also called as temporal arthritis because it will affect your temporal arteries. Usually fairly common in like female population because um, I think because God hates us. Uh, we all females have all the problems. So it is in female population, in elderly population, and it will affect your temporal artery most common other than that carotid, ciliary or retinal. Ciliary or retinal fairly more common than carotid because that is how you end up being blind if it's not being treated well. So now this line is very difficult. I know last one. It's simply you can think it of it. Um, it's like an think of your artery as a pipe and think like there is inflammation happening and because of the inflammation there is like disrupted oxygen flow in regions. Ultimately, if there is no oxygen supply, you will be having skip lesions, skip le ultimately leading to blindness. Like the, the vessel is not able to provide oxygen, ultimately you will be blind. So it is like endovascular damage because of the ischemia and cytokine, which is one of their inflammatory cells mediated inflammation causing to ischemia leading to skip lesions on histology. So we basically do a temporal biopsy in GCA where we can find the skip lesions. So the clinical feature, it is rapid onset. As I have mentioned that it is a rheumatological emergency. It's like very quick. You will have headache, intermittent headache, usually on one side. It can be lateral, but the chances of it being bilateral is fairly low. So usually person will present to you like a female of like 55 year old coming to you and saying that I'm headache having this different unusual kind of headache on like my left side or the right side. You will when you will touch it, she will feel like scar tenderness. OK, so you will have this temporal uh, tender palpable temporal artery. There will be jaw claudication when the person will be moving the jaw. There would be pain. Visual prompts problems if present. God, you have to be very quick now because it has led to a stage where the chances of it being reversible is very less. So guys, when I say GC is very serious, it is very serious. You can also have RG morning stiffness, stiffness. OK. And if it's present, then it is basically because the GCA is being uh, coming together PMR, which is your polymyalgia rheumatica. GCA and PMR has a very 
or how do I say it, like a very association, like 50% of the patients with GCA would be having PMR and 20% of one with a PMR would be having GCA. So they do come together. But the good thing, the treatment for both of them are the same. So it's not a big deal. So we are treating both at the same time. It's fine. And then you can also have stroke. Yeah. Complication or yeah, vision loss. Uh, then you can have if the large arteries like the carotid ones are involved, you can have these aneurysms and dissections as well. And then stroke, as I mentioned earlier. So it should be suspected if a person is more than 50 years old and has a new onset, a sudden onset unilateral temporal area headache. OK, and temporal artery abnormalities such as tendons like if this is present, your first DD should always be GCA. And um, what I have seen is like in the developed nations, the autoimmune diseases are more common, like all know. So new onset headache, one side, just start with your GCA thing. Yeah, and it is a medical emergency. So when I say this, uh, it means it's like whenever a person like this comes, just send the blood for your ESR and CRPs and give the person the starting dose of the medication. Like we will give the patient like 40 to 60 mg of steroids. We will not wait for the results of ESR or the temporal biopsy because giving the medication, uh, like giving one dose of 40 to 60 mg of steroids would not cause that much harm than not giving the medication and patient resulting up into blindnesses. So we will just do the bloods and then we'll so give the medication, send the biopsy, and probably I'm um, telling you the biopsy would be positive. Yeah. Management is like, again, we have to like, it's a fast track system. What we call is um, patient comes, just give the hydroids of steroid in the primary care itself only. Do not wait for anything else. After that, we can send the patient to ophthalmology referral as well. Specialist evaluation that is to patient to be seen by the rheumatologist should be done within three days. But please don't wait for the steroids. Just give patient unilateral headache, one side, 50 plus female, just give steroids. Don't wait for any description. I keep on repeating this because I know people still make mistakes on this. And the usual dose is 40 to 60 mg prednisolone. And once the diagnosis has been made, then we give this uh, steroids for a good 18 to 24 months. And yeah, and now uh, when uh, uh, you all must be knowing that the steroids, uh, if you ask me, they are the wonder drugs, but they do come with a lot of side effects. So giving a person like 40 to 60 mg of prednisolone every day for good 18 to 24 months would definitely be causing a lot of corticosteroids, uh, steroids problems. And some common side effects of steroids are like osteoporosis, cataracts, raised in like lipid levels of the body, hyperglycemia, even depression. So the management is not just limited to the glucocorticoid star therapy. We have to also treat the patient for the steroid side effects as well. And when a patient is on steroids for longer duration, they also tend to become a bit depressed. And for that, we can also start the patient on like uh, CBD, any cognitive behavioral therapies or psychological follow ups. So when we are treating a person for a particular disease, we have to also look for the medication we are giving them and what the side effects of the medication are. So, yeah, that is also something we have to look for. This is now another case study. Uh, a 70 year old female presents with pain and stiffness of shoulder and hip joint. Difficulty in getting up from chair as a result of this pain. So look, this pain and stiffness. She also complains of headache while combing her hair. Her lab tests show raised inflammatory markers, normal CK, creatinine kinase, ANA, RF, and TSH. What is the most likely diagnosis? Again, it says pain and stiffness. There is no weakness. So in polymycytes, you do tend to get some weakness. Also in polymycytes, you have raised CKs, so it's cancelled. There are no any such features of like rheumatoid arthritis, like you all know what RA is, and we would also be discussing that later on, but no such features of nor RA nor SA. Typical showing features of headache while combing your hair. Yeah, GCA, you need a headache. You can like on eating or like on combing your hair, you do tend to get like GCA uh, pain. So that is GCA. And as discussed before, GCA is with polymyalgia rheumatica in 50% of the cases. So the answer of this case study would be PMR. 
So what is PMR now? It is again a chronic systemic rheumatic inflammatory disease characterized by aching and morning stiffness in neck, shoulder and pelvic culture. You can remember this as the pain is usually in the your proximal muscles, neck, your shoulders, your hip. The pain limited to the proximal area and the proximal girdles. Risk factors again, female gender, like obviously. And then risk factors are like older female population. So it's the same as the GCA. Usually this uh, it's fairly more common in the northern European ancestry. Yeah. Mm, yeah, that's um, it can also be when there is some infection like the microplast idea or power, but it's like very rare. Usually the th these three are the main ones. Clinical symptom again, rapid onset, rapid onset, but it's a chronic condition. Guys, don't confuse this. Uh, like I said this, like it occurs in like within a month or like two, three weeks, but it would last for a very big duration of time. So again, for this also, the treatment would be good 18 to 24 months of the steroid therapy. So there is pain and morning stiffness in the proximal limb muscles. There is no weakness. Just remember, like the patient would not say you that I feel very weak or something. They will just say that when I move the joint, the joint feels stiff to me and it's it's causing me some pain. They won't say that they feel like weakness in it. So it's because weak, when there is weakness, it is usually with the polymyositis. So this can be like a um, differential. It's a very important point. Complication as discussed, GCM. And obviously the complication would be of the long term, as we have discussed before, the corticosteroid therapy would be causing a lot of symptoms as well. So yeah, investigation again, they will so uh, ESR, which would be raised, CRP would be raised, HP may be low. And the diagnosis of PMR should be made from combination of the following, these four, like the core features are again, pain, stiffness, proximal muscles, okay, no weakness. And then, and differentials would be RA, but these are like often ruled out from your investigation. Even from the, the fibromyalgia is difficult to rule out, but the fibromyalgia, the, the patient would present to like a chronic uh, symptoms for like more than three to six months. So you will un you will know how it, and anyway, we'll be doing the investigations. But the fibrom, uh, RA is easily like ruled out, but the fibromyalgia, it can be a bit difficult, but again, chronic condition. And they would be having problems in like all the joints, like all the joints and all full body. And they would also exhibit some other features like feeling low in mood. Yeah. And when the patient is having PMR, there would be a positive response to corticosteroid within a week. So when you start the patient off got um, a PMR on corticosteroids, you will see like a great improvement. The patient will be like within a week that yeah, they are feeling much better. So yeah, so it's fine. And then Again, the inflammatory markers to decrease like within four weeks. Yeah, referral to a rheumatologist should be made if there is a doubt, and the treatment is prednisolone 20 mg OD. So for the PMR, it is prednisolone 20 mg, and for your GC, it was like 40 to 60 mg OD. So even if the patient with GC is having PMR, so we are treating it because the drug is like given already. Perfect. So this is a very funny picture. Uh, we would be sharing the slides later on so you can like have a look at it. And so this is like having everything of PMR basically. It defines what PMR is, gives you what the investigation we would be doing, how it is like diagnosed, how the patient presents and how is the treatment. So a good picture. The next topic is osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis again usually common in females. 60 years of age, disorder of synovial joint, and there is like pain. As the most common ones are like your knees, hips. So basically you must be seeing a lot of older population complaining of pain in the joints, difficulty climbing the stairs. They all are having osteoarthritis. Clinical features, pain on movement and worse with prolonged activity. Now this is a very, uh, good line because um, a lot of conditions in rheumatology are associated with the activity like how some conditions like resolve are better in the morning get worse by the evening some are like better in the evening with prolonged so all that stuff so osteoarthritis as more we move the joint more it gets bad so patient will be like i wake up i'm very pain it's very painful during the evening time so it's osteoarthritis on examination, there would be bony swelling, joint deformity, warmth, tenderness, because again, guys, arthritis, 
itis is inflammation. So wherever you see itis, you will be having warm, redness, woolen things. Yeah. And if it's where like septic arthritis, like sepsis, you would be having fever also. So yeah. And there would be muscle wasting and weakness because, you know, patient would eventually say, I don't want to like walk and they would they would like limit their uh, activity. So ultimately the muscle wasting is like unavoidable and then pain restricted movements. Uh, yeah, this case study. Eight year old female presented with bilateral knee joint pain since a few months. She feels that the joints are more swollen and movement of her joints is restricted. You suspect osteoarthritis. What will you have expect on the x-ray? Will you have osteo osteophytes, joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis and cyst or all of the above? Well, when, uh, funnily, whenever there's an option of all of the above, just take that, it's all of the above. Usually the answer is that only. So yeah, you will be having all of the above. So uh, again, your, uh, the good mnemonic for this is loss. So you can like memorize it. L, loss of joint space, O, osteophytes, subarticular sclerosis and subchondral cyst. So the loss is a mnemonic and you will find all this on the x-ray. Well, when I downloaded this image, the, the image was smaller. So I, 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 I felt like it's a good image, but uh, when you expand the image, the pixel tends to get broken down. So it's not that good, but uh, you can see some of the things. Like you can see some osteophytes here. It's like this white line. And then you can see that the joint space is like progressively narrowed down. You see, just compare how much difference is. And then there's sclerosis. Sclerosis is basically thickening of, you can say, thickening and hardening of the bone. So that is not very nicely visible here, but um, on the extra, it would be like very white when you will like, if it's like an osteoarthritic x-ray. And then again, it is arthritis, uh, like inflammation. So CRP, which is the inflammatory markers, obviously would be elevated. Treatment. So for this, the treatment would be like basically NSAIDs and paracetamol for your pain. Physiotherapy, very, very, very much recommended. Like it is like PT and OT are like mean, mean treatment of modalities in the osteoarthritis. Actually not even OT that much, but the PT. Yeah, then pain clinic and psychological support because, you know, uh, older people tend to get sad that they're not uh, if they are like if they have been like independent throughout their life, they do get sad like anyone would. So that is the psychological support is again very important. Then we can also help them like if they lose some weight, muscle strengthening exercises, tra fitness trainings, appropriate footwear that can also help. And the tense that is the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation that this is usually the last resort. Usually the patient doesn't like end up, this is like very last thing we do, uh, but because the main is the like NSAIDs and the physiotherapy. Now the next topic, okay. I think I'm not going too fast. I think I may, you are able to understand it. Anytime if you feel like I'm going fast, just do let me know guys. Yeah. So the next case study is 55 year old male presented with recurrent pain in feet and ankle joints. The patient has background of hypertension and is on some hypertensives. Yeah, guys, uh, this had to be erased. But anyways, you can let me know which hypertensive it would be. Okay. So um, there are some antidepressants like diurethazides, which can uh, cause similar symptoms. Patient is chronic alcoholic and smoker. So there's another hint that the patient is chronic alcoholic. Mm -hmm. What just happened? So sorry, guys. Yeah. X-ray shows punched out lesions with erosion. What is the most probable diagnosis? So in this case study, we have like too many hints recurrent pain, and then antihypertensives, thiazides can cause similar kind of symptoms, chronic alcoholic, yeah, punched out lesions, yeah. So your most common DD is and 55 year old male, luckily a condition which doesn't happen in female, yeah, there are some more too. Anyway, so the your DDs are these two most common ones because it's not osteoarthritis, doesn't seem like, it is not RA, there would be some, a little bit different presentation. So the answer here would be gout, 
the reason it's gout is because a chronic alcoholic and antihypertensive. Antihypertensive would lead to like uric acid problems and chronic alcoholic, again, uric acid problems. It would eventually be gout. So gout is a syndrome. It is an inflammatory response to tissues at deposition of monosodium urate crystals. So when there is like hyperuricemia or high amount of uric acid in our body, we get it get deposited in the tissues leading to like very bad pain, like very bad pain. Person would come like uh, able to keep my feet on the floor. It would be like this bad. Like if it's of the usually it is of the metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe. And if it is of this condition this place, we call it podagra. Other joints can be involved, but usually it's of this joint. And the patient would be like last night I drank a lot of alcohol and this morning I was not able to like keep my feet on the floor. Typical presentation. Other presentation fairly common. Patient on antihypertensive taking thiazide diuretics and then presenting with sudden onset of pain. Very bad pain, pathetic pain. Yeah, and usually it's a monoarthropathy. That's like only one of the joint is involved. Most commonly, podagra, the great joint, great toe. Usually males and postmenopausal females because again, females have to be there somehow. Anyway, postmenopausal female because uh, your estrogen is. Um, Uric acid protective basically. So when uh, it's postmenopausal, we don't have enough estrogen, then the problems get back. Okay, I can. Okay. And women, women will really develop gout before menopause because estrogen are thought to be uricosuric. Yeah. Okay. So risk factors are either there is reduced urate excretion that the uric acid is not getting out from the body which can be an elderly, postmenopausal female, impaired renal function, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, or any drugs like diuretics and aspirin, or there is excess of urate production. That is when the patient is taking a lot of sweeteners, red meat, alcohol. It can be genetic as well. And there is this condition called a tumor lysis syndrome, which usually happens like uh, the patient is having a uh, so like prop usually of like a uh, are hematological cancers primarily. So that time also you get tumor lysis syndrome. Yeah, and in case of some cytotoxic drugs. Clinical features are sudden severe attacks of pain, swelling, redness, tenderness. If it's 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 a picture of your knuck, uh, like your joint of the fingers. You can see this, like it's red, inflamed and swollen. It's a PIP joint. And this is like, this is not it, guys. This is it. Okay, so this is like redness of the great or metatarsophalangeal joint. Investigation is polarized light microscopy of synovial fluids, which will show negatively bifringent urate crystals. I know we don't understand what this is. Just remember, like when you will do microscopy, there will be lines, these lines, just like needle like um, crystals. Serum urate is raised. It can be normal if it's an acute attack because initially it can be like normal, but ultimately after a few like a few days, it tends to get raised. Radiographs would show swallowing. So this is the joint here involved. You can see it's swollen. Treatment is, uh, you know, if it's an acute attack, we just treat it with the NSAIDs. And when we give NSAIDs, there is a big chance of getting um, like, peptic ulcer disease, like increased acid production. So we also give like some omeprazole, Result that is the PPIs, and you can also give oral colchicine, paracetamol as an adjunct to pain relief, and self care that will rest, keep it like keep, keep it in a cool like ice packs, yeah. And lifestyle wise, obviously, like please don't drink and smoke. Apart from this, when the attack of gout has been resolved, like probably after your one to two weeks, we also put the patient of allopurinol or febuxostat. And these are like lifelong now. ULT, that is the urate lowering therapy, is lifelong. And allopurinol is it it is actually a drug which will lower the uric acid levels in the body. So we usually give that, but not during the acute attack, like if the patient is having acute attack, because allopurinol do derange the amount of uric acid in our body. So it's usually better to start, not usually better, like by any like we have to start this after the acute attack of gout has been solved. 
So when patient gout presents, give NSAIDs with PPI or oral colchicine. We can give paracetamol as well for pain relief. And after the gout attack has been resolved, like after two weeks, we start the patient on lifelong allopurinol or fibuxostat if allopurinol is not suited. The other drug, other condition which we were having doubts about, the CPPD, that is the calcium pyrophosphate deposition. Now, this is also monoarthropathy, but usually in the larger joints. So it is a big DD. Clinically, it's a very big DD for the like, differential for gout because gout usually smaller joints. And this is for the larger joints. It is usually have an unknown etiology. I don't know why it is. Like, it's easier to diagnose gout clinically, but not like calcium pyrophosphate, but it has seen that it is common if the patient is like having hyperparathyroid or hyperphosphatemia or hyperthyroidism, like basically the condition which would lead to increase in the calcium in the serum and make your bones weak. So if the serum calcium is raised and then you present with like any monoarthropathy of larger joints, then it is CPPD. So sign and symptoms are the same as gout, just the larger joint is involved. So you will have pain, swelling, redness, bad pain, sudden onset, all that. And when we do the synovial fluid analysis, PPD, now this is something which will make the actual difference. You will see the rhomboid. In gout, we see the needle-like crystals. In CPPD, we see the rhomboid crystals. So it's like... Um, like you can see this one, it's like a rhomboid shape and not as thin as a needle. Yeah. Also, when you have CPPD, there can also be some calcium deposition on the surrounding muscles. So when you do the x-ray, you can find that too sometimes. Sometimes not like it's not that common. Treatment is cool packs, aspiration, and intra-articular steroids in CPPD. Methotrexate can be used if chronic, but the need of methotrexate is like it's very high level guys we don't have to do this like it's even usually it gets resolved with above three so method is an extra add-on point next topic is osteoporosis yeah so what happens is in osteoporosis our bones become weak and brittle guys let me tell you one thing the patient with osteoporosis would not be knowing she or he is having osteoporosis until unless they break a bone so there's no as such pain it's just like you have an unusual trauma like someone hits you in the hand or like on the arm and you fall down and you break a bone so it's very unusual it's just a simple minor fall leading to bone breakage or fracture so that is how you have like Diagnose osteoporosis. Like, okay, yeah. And then again, obviously, you know, 50 year old woman, yeah, 40% more chance osteopathic because again, estrogen is gone. So, yeah, a lot of problems come back in her life. Plus, telling you guys, dermatology is all just problems, more problems to females. Yeah, <laughs> anyways. So, osteoporosis results from loss of bone mass. Uh, you can see here, like the here, the like the the basically in osteoporosis is like your bone mineral densities is decreased to a significant amount so you can see here like this appears so much fuller but this is so hollow like so hollow like so it's like drastic like it has become so spongy yeah so the risk factors are female postmenopausal low calcium intake smoking family history vitamin d deficiency elderly and some medication as discussed before, steroids, they do cause osteoporosis, excess of thyroid having some diuretics and class six and anticonvulsive. Other conditions like these can also lead to osteoporosis. Now, the best test for detecting osteoporosis is a DEXA scan. This is a picture I found and I just thought of adding it up. Like this is kind of machine so the person will not feel claustrophobic here. So, and this is how we do it. Uh, it says that the it, it like it's known that the DEXA uses very less emissions, like the very less emissions, but still we don't do it in a pregnant female because we have to be extra cautious. But like this, it's like very less radiations. And usual normal bone mineral density is from minus one, to like two point five. If it's less than minus one to two point five, it's osteopenia. What is osteopenia? Osteopenia is basically like a precondition which will eventually lead to osteoporosis if not managed. 
yeah if it's more than minus 2.5 like coming downwards the minus like i know you know what i mean then it's osteoporosis so the treatment the treatment is for most of the condition the first thing is lifestyle yeah so we have to increase our physical activity we have to smoke smoke stop smoking we have to maintain a good BMI, reduce alcohol intake, reduce smoking, dietary intake, increase your calcium supplementation, drink milk, you know, vitamin D supplements. Yeah. After this, we put the patient on oral bisphosphonates. Now, what are these? They are the bone resorptive drugs. What does that mean? That the bone will start taking the calcium from surrounding to the blood. So the serum calcium, if given in like excess amount, then the serum calcium will decrease, but like we monitor it nicely. So the will start resorbing the calcium alendronic acid and residronate so they are the first line options these are both both uh, bisphosphonates we can also do hrt that is the hormone replacement therapy in the younger postmenopausal hormone replacement that we give the estrogen from outside yeah but usually the problem is resolved this is only we can give this to meals but not this to meals, obviously so yeah and the other are we can also give calcitonin that is a calcium analogs estrogen and the ssris are the selective estrogen receptor modulators basically they will activate the receptors which will absorb estrogen whatever is in the body yeah very important thing that bisphosphonate we only give this bis, bisphosphonate is like a medication only taken once a week at the same time like if you're starting it on a monday we will take it next monday it has to be taken first thing in the morning with a glass of milk and the patient has to sit upright when they're taking it so, yeah because uh bisphosphonates can lead to esophagitis esophageal ulcers even osteoporosis of the jaw it's a very strong drug so please take the medication with a full glass of water or milk uh, no oh uh, sorry not with milk sorry sorry just with water while sitting standing empty stomach not milk guys i just said that by mistake because milk will decrease the absorption of bisphosphonate so with a full glass of water and treatment is usually once a week like one tablet every week so with this we finish our osteoporosis as well so next case study is a 38 year old female with a history of arthritis with a two month history of low grade fever finger pain and stiffness the physical features of the hand are shown now what is the most common diagnosis so this is the hand of the person the female okay it's not sle reason being is um, sle just doesn't have like they do have joint impairment but the main thing is not joint it's not gout because it doesn't match with anything given in the history it's not osteoarthritis because again 38 year old female uh, doesn't seem like and like it's just the hand symptoms also usually we have done that it's the knees and the bigger joints so it all fits with the ra that is the rheumatoid arthritis but it has given a family history so ra has a very big fem uh, genetic predominance so what is it basically so rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease in which the normal immune response is directed against an individual's own tissue so again our body starts harming our own self so that is an autoimmune condition it can it ha it has like seen a very like a very prominent genetic predominance it is characterized by persistent inflammatory synovitis so the synovial membrane is inflamed and when the synovial membrane is involved i'll show you what the synovial membrane is inflamed it leads to cartilage damage bone erosion joint deformity and disability like you will have initially you will have pain and you would not be able to move the joint ultimately the pain would still be there but the joint become a definite like a structure they will be formed so this is a normal uh, extra cut section so you can say it's all normal but here the synovial membrane is in like inflamed leading to like necrosis and like this cartilage is being destroyed yeah so it can happen at any age but usually at third to sixth decades like that is like 30 to 60 years old female obviously pattern is joint in one could be polyarticular oligo or mono poly is like more than eight oligo is like two to eight and mono is like less than one Oh, I mean one. Yeah, there would be morning stiffness, and now this condition, you have stiffness in the morning, and it gets better with physical activity. 
a condition we did before the arthritis if you guys remember in that it was the opposite thing the person would be fine in the morning but the problem get worsen with a physical activity so patient would have like pain and everything in the evening here it is more in the morning so it's morning thing and small joints of hands and feet are typically involved so these are the joints which are commonly involved like the smaller ones it can also involve the bigger joints but usually hands and feet the smaller ones are usually involved and there is pain and swelling morning stiffness yeah and you see this photo you can see that there is like ulnar deviations like the hands are like more to ulnar side like if you stand this is your ulnar side right so it gets like this i know if you can see or not but it's like this yeah. also very common the beauty nose deformity which is usually in your pip the proximal interphalangeal joint like this and your swan neck deformity which is in the dip the distal interphalangeal joint yeah this one so beauty nose is this one and dip is this one so you get hand like it's a swan neck shape you know the, how the swan neck is so it's like that cool in ra we also tend to have a lot of extra articular now how do you remember this that we have extra articular because as i mentioned that it is like autoimmune disease our body is harming our own cells so they don't just harm at a particular thing they harm at various places so yeah so there would be constitutional symptoms that's your fever myalgia tiredness rheumatoid nodules we would be uh, i would be showing that how it is hematological problems like you would have anemia leukopenia or leukocytosis and thrombocytosis then there is this symptom called uh, syndrome called felty syndrome it is a triad of like rheumatoid arthritis splenomegaly and neutropenia so when you have neutropenia you would lead to like so many infections neutrophils are like decreased in the body leading to a lot of infections splenomegaly again infections and then ra you can also have respiratory symptoms like pleural effusion pneumonitis ulnary nodules ild is fairly common i don't know why i put in the last but it should be in the first like ild is very common with ra cvs which show pericarditis pericardial effusion uh, cardiomyopathy vasculitis can be there pneumonia multiplex very common very common usually it would be like a girl go 30 30 20 30 40 years old girl monad multiplex having history of ra so very common presentation then you could have some problems with the cns as well peripheral neuropathy most of the chronic condition which are like for years and years ultimately do need to neuropathy eventually like even your diabetes too that so yeah. and i now i symptoms i think out of all of these apart from the constitution one i is the most commonly one involved you get episcleritis and scleritis a lot more common in ra than any other condition yeah guys you would be getting the slides by the end so you can like memorize it as well it's like extra articular feature because these do help by forming the diagnosis of ra as well so these are the rheumatoid nodules now now these are the small subcutaneous nodules on the extensor side so you this one is rheumatoid nodule this one is rheumatoid nodule and these ones in here we can see this and these these are the rheumatoid nodule they can also be like a um, marker or disease because you tend to get rheumatoid nodule in at a later stage investigation we would be doing cvc we will have like tlc dlc hp we have discussed low tlc you can be high or low then obviously our inflammatory markers would be raised crp esr serum amyloid would be raised these ones then albumin and transferrin they would be low rf and nd now these two are very important guys uh, let me tell you one thing that the r is like very sensitive and ndccp is very specific so how do we know what does this mean so rf sensitivity is like most of the people uh, would be having rf positive if they are having rheumatoid arthritis specificity me means like if this patient is having ndccp antibodies then by default he is having ra rf can be positive in various conditions so most people i don't know how to put this into words like but uh, you can understand it like sensitivity is uh, out of like 100 people um, 60 would be having rf positive but that is not compulsory that they all are having ra but if they having ntccp positive they are definitely having um so again 
RF, 85% with RA become RF positive in first two years. Positive RF does not definitively mean that the patient is having RA, but it is common in a lot of people. But there are other causes of positive RF as well, like rheumatoid arthritis, Jogren's, polyarthritis, sarcoidosis. SLE has RF positive as well. Yeah, but if you have NTCCP positive, 95% you are definitely, definitely having RA. So and this is expensive 65 percent it's person yeah and the other is you can also do ANA it is positive in like 30 to 40 percent ANA is also found in like SLE and yeah so a radiological feature would be like you will have like this uniformly decreased joint space in osteoarthritis it was not uniform but here it is uniform yeah you can also have like collapse and joint destruction because there is like synovial fluid inflammation ultimately leading to like destruction of the cartilage ultimately after cartilage there's the bone yeah ultrasound can also be done and as well as the mri when to suspect RA. now this is a photo from the ohcm you can like uh, read this it's a very good like it's basically a diagnostic criteria if you have more than one swollen joint and like scores more than six that are diagnostic. So this is like a table. So it includes joint involvement, how many joints are involved, serology, that is like your RF and NTCC, then your acute phase reactants that are your anti-inflammatory markers, ESR, CRP, and the duration of symptoms. And if their scores are more than six, they are like diagnostic for RF. So it's a very good table. Now the management. The management for RA is ADMARS. DMARS are disease modifying anti rheumatoid drugs. Usually we start with the monotherapy initially, but they can be given in clumps. The most common one you must be doing is methotrexate. Yeah. And we can also give an hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is basically an anti-malarial drug, but it has it, it has been seen that Hydroxychloroquine has a lot of uh, benefits in the rheumatological diseases as well. Apart from this, a short course breeding treatment of lower corticoids can be done. Again, as I've told you, like the according to me, steroids are the wonder drugs, which comes with a lot of problems as well, but still they are the wonder drugs. So like a short term of steroids in between the therapies can be done is in between therapies. Apart from this, as the patient is having pain, then NSAIDs. But whenever giving NSAIDs, please, please, please make sure the patient is not having any hepatorenal problems. And whenever giving NSAIDs, give it with PPIs that are the proton from inhibitors because NSAIDs lead to increase acid production. Yeah. Apart from this non-pharmacological, again, OTPT, very important. PT is the physiotherapy, which is like the exercises, and the OT is like occupational therapy. Then hand exercises, podiatry is the foot ones, and psychological support because chronic conditions do tend to lead patients feeling very sad, which is very obvious and very understandable. So psychological support is, uh, apart from treating the disease, I think psychological support is the second thing because patients, it's, it's really hard for them. And then, of course, timely follow ups. We can also do surgery in some patients. Uh, they can do like knuckle surgery. Some patients, when they complain, like they're not able to bend hands at all or things like that. At that time, we can also do like knuckle surgery where we implant the silicone knuckles inside. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, we refer the patient and then rheumatology and surgery collectively performs it. it yeah. Now, the, another case study. So, with that, we finished rheumatoid arthritis as well. 25 year old male comes to you complaining of back pain and stiffness. He complains that the stiffness is more in the morning when he wakes up, but it is relieved as the day passes and he exercises. The patient also complains that he had an eye problem in the past. He also tells you that her sister has similar problem. What is the most likely diagnosis? So again, 25 year old male, definitely not rheumatoid arthritis. SLE uh, doesn't seem like to be SLE. Osteoarthritis doesn't match 25 year old male, doesn't match. So the answer here is ankylosing spondylitis. Now what is ankylosing spondylitis? It's a, again, chronic inflammatory disease of spine and sacroiloid joints. Now this condition is in like the spine is the most common area. Guys, do remember that all the rheumatological diseases are like very crisscross. Like if this 
like the even your patient with a RA like a rheumatology disease come in, you know that uh, the symptoms are very much obvious for the disease. Like we have not discussed any disease till now, which is involving the spine. It's the first one and a typical presentation of a male young with having problems in the spine. So ankylosing spondylitis would be your first DD. Finally, a condition which male is more common than female. A non etiology, but it is seen that it runs in the family and usually male population and again, a young male is involved. The symptoms are low back pain, usually back stiffness improves with exercise, not relieved by rest. There are conditions like RA and ankylosing, which are in the morning and relieves with the exercise, and the osteoarthritis one is more in the evening, which is getting which gets worse with the exercise. Okay, so there is obviously limitation of movement. And guys, if you can see here, like there is a particular form formation, like is adapting a question mark posture. So it is very common, like you can be asked which kind of question is usually seen in the later stage of anchor. It's like the question mark posture. OK, so in ankylosing spondylitis, we also tend to get enthesitis. What is enthesitis? It is basically the inflammation where there's tendons and ligaments, basically where the joint is attached. Oh, uh, yeah. Most common one is the Achilles tendon. This one you can see here, it's very normal but here it's inflamed. So Achilles tendon is the most common one involved, but there can be other involvements as well, like the iliac crest one or the ischial debrostris. Iliac crest, ischial debrostris, all that. And the most is Achilles. So in ankylosing spondylitis, just remember like this, it's A for ankylosing spondylitis and the extra articular manifestation, extra extra manifestation are also mostly of A, 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 A of the E system. So you ocular, you'll get anterior uveitis. Also conjunctivitis, but at least remember the A ones. Heart, aortic regurgitation, aortitis, lung, apical fibrosis, kidney, amyloidosis, and shield tendonitis. So remember the A ones, it's like a mnemonic, ankylosing, all the A extra particular manifestations. We also do a Shabba test in ankylosing spondylitis. So what we do is like we measure at the L5 and then we just at the same time, we just do a 10 centimeter above and mark it here as well. And then we ask patient to bend as forward as possible with while extending their knees. And after that, the difference is recorded. So usually when the patient is normal, uh, like not having ankle or spondylitis, the difference is more than five centimeters. Why in uh, ankylosing spondylitis, the difference is not increased because you tend to get bamboo spines. Bamboo spines is like you can see there's like particular form of structure formed like these squares. So obviously the bending ability of the bone, if the spine is somewhere lost, you're not able to bend that much also. Yeah, so it would not be more than five centimeters. So investigation art like x-ray is a very important one for spine formation. And the CVC would again, because chronic condition do tend to get uh, decreased HP levels. So anemia, raised ESR, because again, it's spondylitis, itis, inflammation. So your inflammatory markers will be traced. And genetic order, HLA, B27, human leukocyte antigen, B27, which be positive in a lot of condition. There's also syndesmophyte formation in this and sacroiliitis. Sacroiliitis, again, is inflammation. Management is exercise. The more you exercise, the more better you get. NSH for the pain. It has been seen that TNF alpha blockers, TNF is tumor necrosis factor. It is a substance produced during the inflammation only. Also help, but usually they are given severe conditions. It's not like the first treatment. It's just a severe thing. It's not controlled by anything else. It's the last resort. Steroid injections can help. Surgery can be done, but again, rarely done because it's, like, surgery is again the last resort. And then PT. And we can give bisphosphonate as well if there's a risk of spinal fractures. Perfect. So the next case study. OK, guys, I think we are going very fast. I, am, I really hope that you are able to get what I'm saying. If uh, if by the end you would be having any questions, you can just let me know. Yeah, so the another um, or even if sometimes what happens is like we don't get questions as frequently like after the so you can what you can do is you can go through the slides and after that when you get any question, you can just email me. I'll try to like um, get back to you as soon as possible. Yeah. So the next case study is 
a 20 years old female complains of painful joints since a few weeks which has been progressive young female who is having painful joints okay and it is getting worse with every passing day she also says she is feeling feverish lethargy since a month now since a month is a chronic thing guys on examination she has butterfly rash on her face now this has this thing and this thing has given you the answer already and her lab investigation shows positive double stranded dna antibodies so again what is she suffering from they doesn't systemic sclerosis would not present like this they would be having more of the organ involvement and there would not be any butterfly rash or any this positive any positive ra we know it's not ra pmr gauti we know so it's sle obviously it's sle double ntds dna specific for sle again if the patient is having ntds dna definitely she is having sle and most patient of sle would have ana positive but ana is again as we have done before ana is the sensitive but ds dna is specific so when there is something specific that the person is definitely having sle and most of the patient with sle would be having ana positive so i hope uh, you are able to get what i'm saying but like the specific things is an inner disease they are definitely having the disease yeah so sle is basically a progressive chronic autoimmune disease that results in inflammation and tissue damage characterized by flare spontaneous remission and relapse so it like comes and goes comes and goes can affect any part of the body most common part involved is the kidney usually and uh, one of the very famous personalities she also had sle uh, lupus nephritis basically she was selena gomez i hope you guys know that so she also got her like she also she is like patient of s lupus lupus basically lupus nephritis which is like a sub branch of sle risk factor females white population usually uh, usually appears in like child bearing age group it can be second indicate as well like child bearing age genetic predominance is present yeah and 50% of sle are life or uh, like organ and life threatening nephritis being the most common clinical is pole painful swollen joints unexplained fever rashes usually on this area like it's some it's a picture of malar rash it spares the nasolabial fold it's not here but it's on your cheek and the nose but not here so it spares nasolabial fold somehow yeah they can be chest pain unusual loss the nods phenomenon is very common sensitivity to the sun so these patients of sle are often told to like wear heavy amounts of sunblock edema mouth ulcers swollenness so sle also tend to have a lot of extra article extra um, manifestations again this picture is of o because i think ohcm is the best book out there to like for any disease so i didn't find any other like i was just like okay what we do ohcm we'll just do that yeah so as if there is more than four clinical pictures present and out of four there is one laboratory then we diagnose it sle okay so acute cutaneous like there would be malar rash or butterfly rash which we just saw in the last picture yeah there can be discoid rash erythematous rash patches you know people have on the body parts then there can be alopecia loss of hair nasal ulcers synovitis is like involving the synovial membrane serocitis the bones urinalysis can be seen proteinuria very much common if this lupus nephritis this is very common there neurological features can be there hematological again decreased in their hp leukopenia and thrombo like all that is are decreased in sle so in sle all three gets decreased and then laboratory would be like positive ana which is present in most of the sle as i said like ana is like sensitive so most of the patients with sle would be having ana positive but again if you remember ana was also positive in like 20 to 30 percent of the rheumatoid arthritis patient so it is sensitive but if your patient is having double stranded dna positive it is definitely sle so this is like specific there are other antibodies which can be present as well like anti smith anti phospholipid and the complement levels now the investigations we do anemia thrombocytopenia lymphopenia particularly neutropenia yeah 
exclude other reasons like medication or infection because you know SLE can also be because of some of certain medications which are primarily hydralazine, isoniazid. Isoniazid we give in like TB patients for a long duration. So yeah, procainamide, methyl doba for BP and yeah. And the very good way to find if it's drug induces is obviously if the patient is using these antibiotics, uh, if a patient uses these medications. And also in drug induced lupus, you will have antihistone antibodies. So if the antihistone antibodies are present, so it's usually drug induced lupus. Antihistone doesn't come in other ways. Yeah. No single test can determine. Obviously, it's a diagnosis of like clinical diagnosis, basically. And diagnostic is we have done these. Management is avoid sun, obviously sunblock, exercise, medication, counseling. Again, chronic diseases would lead to like patient being depressed, very understandable. So counseling is important and surgery. Medications are NSAIDs, NSAIDs for the fever. Yeah, again with PPIs, of course, because we are giving NSAIDs for a longer duration. So we have to give them with PPIs that are the proton bomb inhibitors. Then anti-malarial like the hydroxychloroquine. As I told you, like anti malarials are also used in a lot of times in rheumatology. So it is very like I think in SLE, it is one of the main drugs. Like even we use it in RA, but in RA, it's the, uh, still the methotroxate is the main one. But here it's the hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, and it has seen that earlier starting of like hydroxychloroquine will lead to like better, like the disease would not progress and like it's better to start it early as possible. Yeah, antimalarials have this lipid lowering properties, which is a good thing again. So if the patient is taking steroids as well for antimalarials, so it, because steroids will lead to like hyper uh, cholesterolemia and then they will combat it. Yeah. OK, so uh, again, glucocorticoids, sometimes the steroids, we give that, but a lot of side effects. But again, if we give this, so at least some of the side effects are looking for. Methotrexate is also usually given, but it is usually for like the RA. Yeah. This drug is uh, important, mycophenolate, because mycophenolate is like very much used if it's renal involvement, that is the lupus nephritis, which is in SLE, renal nephritis is like 50% common. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And then azathioprine can also be used for renal hematological muscle, but again, if it's renal, then the first drug is mycophenolate. Now the lupus nephritis, which I have been talking about so long. So there is the urine protein excretion. You will have obviously the protein is like being lost in the urine. So you will have edema. You will have problems with your for bloods and you there would be like loss of this in the urine. GFR would be decreased. You would have like kidney function derangements, obviously lupus nephritis. Again, all of this would eventually lead to hypertension and the treatment is steroids. And another drug which we did was mycophenolate. I did I did this because mycophenolate. And uh, a lot of the times, uh, it is a serious condition, guys. So a lot of the times we do the renal transplant for this. Yeah. So the SLE key points are diagnosis by rheumatology is the gold standard. So basically just clinically. Screen early for any organ threatening disease. Early treatments are NSAIDs. Steroids may be useful. And patients should relieve antimineral, which is our hydroxychloroquine. Adherence is important. We have to like educate the patient to like take it like really because CSL is very serious. And even mind disease should be overseen by lupus care specialist. Like if, if you think like there might be just refer the patient, please guys. It's a serious disease. Now our last topic for the day is Renaud's phenomena. Renaud's phenomena is primarily not a disease, but like more of a sign of a lot of disease. So we get Renaud's phenomena positive in like various rheumatological diseases. What is that? It's basically, there is like peripheral digital ischemia, which means that the oxygen is not properly spread to the distal limbs, usually preceded by cold or emotions. And usually as it is digital, obviously finger and the toes. How it is initially when the oxygen supply is cut off, they'll get pale. When it gets pale, there's no oxygen, obviously, then they'll get blue. And when they get blue, there's like reactive hyperemia occurring. So flush of redness would be there. And it is painful, guys. It is painful. It, if 
idiopathic, like we don't have any underlying disease cause of it, then it's Raynaud's disease. But uh, when there is an underlying cause present, then it's called Raynaud's phenomena. And uh, this includes um, underlying can be SLE, RA, dermatoid polymyositis, S uh, systemic sclerosis, very common in sclerosis. Raynaud's phenomena is very, very commonly seen in this. Then Burgers disease, which is also known as thrombogenesis, um, then thoracic, thoracic outlets uh, syndrome, and yeah, and also sometimes beta blockers can also lead to this. And it is again diagnosed clinically, plus minus the disease of any uh, any presence of any underlying disease, and the management is as it is specific with gold. Obviously, we have to keep the hand warm. Stop smoking because smoking leads to vasoconstriction, guys. Vasoconstriction would be there. Obviously, the oxygen would not be spread properly, and then you will get it. Yeah. Nifedipine and sildenafil, they are the vasodilators. They will aid the vessels in your distal limb, distal digits. And primrose oil, like you spread it, it has seen to like improve. So yeah, maybe it helps. Yeah. And with this, we finish our rheumatological revision course. I hope I was not uh, very fast. Um, you would be given slides. And if you have any questions, do let me know. You can always email me at rajakshi.khana at nhs.net. Thank you.